Hey everyone, welcome to the talk. Uh, this one is about building, analyzing, and creating biomedical knowledge graphs using this new open source library that we're releasing called Grabster. Uh, just a little bit of intros. So we, my name is Vishnu Vetrail. I'm the CTO and founder of uh, Yskewed AI. We're a knowledge graph company. We've been focused on building knowledge graphs for the biomedical space for the last uh, five or so years. Um, and uh, with me, I have uh, my co-founder, uh, Alex Thomas. Alex, why don't you go yourself and introduce yourself quickly? Hi, I'm Alex Thomas. I'm the principal data scientist here at YSQ. Uh, and I've been working on a lot of, you know, different sort of like NLP and data science stuff over over time. We've known Vishnu for a long time. And really excited to uh, show you all what we've been doing with knowledge graphs. Thanks, Alex. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So quick rundown of the agenda for today. So we'll be talking about especially in the biomedical data sp uh, space, there's been a lot of data explosion that's been happening, uh, all kinds of data that's been growing exponentially. We'll quickly talk about that. And then how knowledge graphs really address uh, solving that problem, but also what are the complexities that come with it? And this is where we'll say, okay, you know, we'll introduce Grafster and how we think this can help um, address some of the complexities involved in building new knowledge graphs in this space. And finally, I'll hand it off to Alex at that point, and he'll go talk about like the, the Grafster architecture itself and do a deep dive and also walk you through a quick tutorial of building a knowledge graph, inquiring it as well. All right, that let's get started. So yeah, and we all know this, you know, as just being like data practitioners that the data has been growing exponentially, especially unstructured data. Um, and uh, it's, it's basically, at least in the research side, it's no longer possible for human beings to sort of keep up with the amount of research that's being published. This is just a graph of all the articles that, you know, that have been indexed by PubMed. And as you can clearly see, this is, this is clearly exponential uh, in the last few years, especially. And, and this is, you know, what only part of it, right? Like I haven't even, you know, included all of the, the, the sequencing data that's, that's actually been growing, which is also in the similar scale of growth. And, and and so there's so much more data that's that's actually you know being generated in the in the last few years, and in order to make sense of all of this, um, you know, we believe that at least knowledge graphs are a huge part of it and can actually help with that, right? But the big, obviously, the big thing is like how do we fuse all of this data, uh, both structured and unstructured, into a knowledge graph, so we can actually start making sense of all this data to be able to start building models and making predictions and all of that other stuff that we like to do. So this is exactly what we did. And then, you know, we were here last year in NLP Summit and we were talking about this, this knowledge graph we built with, uh, with Roche Pharmaceuticals, we're called Orpheus, where we did exactly this on a lot of, by taking a lot of the public data sets, things like PubMed and, uh, you know, uh, Wikidata and like, so, you know, clinical trials and grants data and, and so many other data sources. And we sort of fused all of this together and we built this massive knowledge graph, you know, tens of billions of facts and hundreds of millions of facts extracted from the text and, you know, over around hundred million entities and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, we took a better part of like a couple of years, I want to say, trying to build this knowledge graph. And, you know, we eventually, yeah, we have this knowledge graph, we have it automated and like, it's actually, you know, pretty useful. I mean, we're actually coming out with some really interesting research based on it with Roche shortly. But one thing we realized is that it's not a very simple you know, process. The process is, is very tedious and very cumbersome and complex. Just to give you a, a, an idea of like what it took for us to actually build this knowledge graph, you know, there's actually 10 steps, 10, you know, high level steps, I should say. There's many, many more steps than just 10. You know, I just took a snippet of the <laughs> the pipeline itself, part of the pipeline that we use to build this knowledge graph. And like, it's it's, it's this screenshot as you can see on the left. And that's only sort of uh, part of it. As you can see, it's, it's, it's a really complex process. It involves data acquisition, schema selection, data mapping, fusion, NLP, of course, you know, converting the triples into the right format, loading it into a graph database. We actually use um, Neptune internally for our Things and then we have to do the graph querying, link prediction. But by the way, it's completely different, different library we have to use to do link prediction things, and of course, visualization and querying and all the other stuff. So, which got us to 
thinking is like, oh my God, this process, you know, we love knowledge graphs. It's great. We think it's the answer to all of the data explosion problems in this space, but how we, there should be a simpler way to do this, right? And so that's really what started us down the path of like, oh, maybe we should just see if we can build a library that can make this uh, process much more simple and open source it, you know, so, so people can actually benefit from our pain. And, and that was the genesis for the idea, you know, for building this open source library we're talking about called Grafster. Oh, I've been watching a lot of token, but so anyway, uh, the idea is that it will be this one knowledge graph library that you, you would ever use to not only acquire the data and talk about all the 10 steps we went through, but but really, you know, build a functional knowledge graph that you can actually do things with without having to, you know, build this massive pipeline that I showed you from before, right? And in most cases, not, not all, but like most cases, you probably can stay within the confines of a, in a you know, Spark cluster which means that you can be completely horizontally scalable. Right? So that's the other problem currently with knowledge graphs is like at some point you have to leave a scalable environment like Spark and go into a graph database that's mostly, it's, it's vertically scaled, right? Where you just have to throw more hardware and it's, it's, not, it's not horizontally scalable. And, and, and so this would obviate the need for most of those, right? At least there's some use cases where you still might have to go to a graph database. And of course we wanted to make it open source, you know, Apache licensed and whatnot. And, you can find out a lot more about how to get started at graphstore.org. They actually put up a, a sort of a site for that. Um, and, and so that is the genesis of this idea. So at this point, um, I would like to hand it off to Alex where he can uh, talk more about the architecture of Grabster and get into you know deep dive and, and walk you through some examples how you would actually go about building and all those graphs using this library. All right, Alex. Thank you, Vishen. So, yeah, as far as for the uh, the architecture, we want to go with the library. Um, so we realize that there's many different things you both need to do when constructing your uh, when constructing your knowledge graph, but then there's also many different sorts of things you want to do when using it. And currently, there's lots of different solutions out there that handle one or maybe two of these things, but a lot of times they have different ways of storing the data or, or different access patterns. And really what we wanted is we wanted to have uh, sort of a common place where we could build the knowledge graph, uh, both from the structured da data and the unstructured data. We could query it, we could do machine learning on it. So that's what th this uh, library design is. So uh, the idea is that Graf Grafster core is the core of the library. And it's focused mainly on how the con configuration of a, uh, of a of a pipeline is, is, is built as well as uh, configuration for machine learning or for querying. Um, uh, the other part that's in core is the uh, tools necessary for fusing structured data. Um, after that, we have the graphs data datasets uh, module and where it, what's stored there is sort of basic IO and those references the certain commonly used uh, data sets that we often, um, uh, uh, that we think people will often want to integrate. Grafster Query is a library that lets us query Sparkle on Spark. Um, so that way you don't need to like do all this processing and then uploading it into a, a, a triple store like what Vishnu was talking about. And so you can just query directly on Spark. I'll get more into that later. That's the one I'll be demoing. Um, then we have the Grafster Text module. And so this is more of an abstract module. So we have these different um, uh, uh, interfaces, actually traits for doing Scala. And our reference implementation for these is actually with Spark NLP. Uh, for Grafster AI, it's a similar thing to the one with text. Uh, this is for doing link prediction or other graph-based models. And the reference implementation there is DGL. Uh, next slide. So the first step in building your knowledge graph is always going to be writing your configuration. So because we're fusing together disparate data sets, sometimes the same information is actually stored in different ways with uh, uh, different sorts of references. So if let's say one place uh, data is uh, the names of particular entities are stored under a particular column name, but in another one, it's graph data and there's a particular predicate that actually refers to the names, you can store that under the same namespace so that when you're fusing them together, you can easily reference them together. Um, also, if you have uh, sort of large 
uh, or, or long uh, data set specific references. This, this is a, something that comes up, especially with graphs, where you could have these long URIs. It's better to store it inside the configuration. That way you can reference it more cleanly in your actual pipelines. Another benefit to that is that uh, with these configurations is that if you have some, uh, uh, if you're changing like some of the uh, data that you're pulling that's more or less the same, you might not even need to change your pipelines that much. You just need to change the configuration. So once you have your configuration, the first step you want to do is you want to begin enrich, enriching your data. So in this case, the example on the right-hand side is from a configuration we have for merging clinical trials with mesh. So we take the mesh graph and we want to add in clinical trials data. So that means on the clinical trial side, we need to map entities we're extracting into mesh entities. Um, so we're going to do that with like the conditions and the interventions. Um, uh, now, there are new entities we want to add, like, for example, the clinical trials themselves. Those aren't entities within Mesh. Um, so the enriching is going to create ways for you to refer to the entities once you've brought them to the graph. And once you've done that, you want to map uh, uh, the predicates to properties as well as um, uh, mapping the actual relationships between them. So, for example, if you have a table that has two entities in there, you might be able to define a specific relationship from that. Um, as we do here when we have the relationship in between a clinical trial and the condition that's being set. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the fusing of unstructured data. This is obviously a much more complex task than fusing structured data, which is itself actually pretty complex. So the first step with fusing unstructured data is you want to um, pull out sort of the low-hanging fruit. So this is going to be for example, defining entities to represent the documents. This will be important if you're looking to find, oh, I'm going to look up documents that refer to lung cancer, and I want to find what genes are mentioned in those documents. In that case, you need to have the documents defined as an entity, as well as extracting the relationships between the um, uh, entities and that document. So once you have the documents defined, you also want to pull out sort of the structured metadata. So this can be along the lines of publication date um, uh, or other fixed descriptions, keywords, what have you, inside uh, uh, the how, however the, the documents are stored. Those are some small text ones you might want to pull out. So title might actually be a good property to store. It's kind of long text for what you normally see in a knowledge graph, but it's not too long. Abstract's probably a bit longer, probably a bit too long. Uh, but also authors. So authors will sometimes be stored with an ID, but other times they'll just be stored with their name, in which case then you have another complex process where you need to merge um, uh, uh, these two different references as the same person. Um, and finally, as I mentioned before, we want to get the extract out the named entities referenced in the document. Now, it's good in this case to uh, be able to reuse this information because we probably want to store this for further processing. Um, so the, and there's also property extraction and, and a number of other things you could extract, but these are sort of the low hanging fruit. This is stuff where you are extracting specific information about the document, like it's a uh, topic, um, uh, or you're saying, oh, there's a reference to an entity in here. Um, what comes next is going to be the more sophisticated. Next slide. So. After we've fused in sort of that low-hanging fruit, we have the uh, much richer but more difficult to get at relationship extraction problem. Now, from our, our way of seeing it, there's basically two approaches. There's extracting uh, uh, directly a particular relationship or particular set of relationships. And then there's extracting via the uh, actual language. So extracting, we call path extraction. I'll sort of get to why we call it that. So direct extraction is where you're trying to predict the existence of a uh, uh, of a claim for a relationship in the document. So you can do that document wide with document classification, or you can do that with with tagging. So that is where you're trying to find where in the document a particular relationship is claimed. Now those two have pros and cons to them. With document classification, um, you can get relationships that are claimed over a long distance in the document, perhaps a disease is mentioned in one paragraph and then multiple paragraphs later, 
that disease is just referred to uh, uh, with a uh, you know, it is referred to and it establishes a relationship to a gene, but it may not have ever actually co-occurred in the same sentence. Um, uh, uh, those two entities may have never occurred in the same sentence. Um, tagging, on the other hand, um, uh, won't be able to find those long distance relationships. Dark classification, though, on the downside is going to be much messier. You're going to have a lot of text, probably very few relationships to extract. So it's going to be more noisy and you, you're going to need to gather. It will be more difficult to gather labels as your labelers will need to look over the whole document. Tagging on the other side is easier because you have smaller contexts that you can give people to say, oh, is there a relationship claimed here? Or is there this specific relationship claimed here? So those are sort of the pros and cons of those approaches. So one that we've been uh, working on is what we call path extraction. So that is that we know that these claims, especially the ones that occur within a sentence, have to be um, represented more or less in the language. They have to, they have, to have some sort of syntactic representation. So we pull out these paths between two entities. So if you imagine sort of the syntax trees that we may have all learned in school, if you draw that out of a sentence and you know, well, this part's an entity and this other part's an entity, and then you just figure out, well, how do I traverse this tree to get there? We call that a path and we extract them and we cluster them. And then we want to map those clusters to predicates. This is based off of the work of Percha and Altman. This is a, a, a link on the slide here. They did really great work, and in their mapping, uh, that in their um, implementation, the mapping was done through human labeling. However, they were just trying to create legible, human understandable uh, names for the clusters, whereas we're trying to map to particular predicates uh, where we have plenty of existing examples. So right now we are working on building a machine learning based approach to automatically map uh, path clusters to uh, predicates. Next slide, please. So now we have this wonderful graph where we've had, we've merged in these uh, uh, structured data sets, we've merged in unstructured data. So we want to be able to access it. And as, as Vishnu was saying, so many triple stores are single machine instances. So if you have a large cluster with, oh, I don't know, billions of rows, it can be either expensive to get a machine that's that large um, and even worse, it can be slow and there's plenty of other problems with it. So it's common for graphs to just have a timeout where, oh, your query took too long. Well, that's it. You're never getting a response back to that query. It's just going to die and say it took too long. Um, and another terrible side to it is that if you have one machine, imagine writing billions of, of, of triples to it. And it takes a really long time to initially stand that up. Meanwhile, Spark is really good at handling large data. It's sort of its whole reason. So having Spark to be able to run Sparkle is a great opportunity. So right now, the current um, uh, query module is built off of a, uh, a project from uh, uh, GSK. And that is where they're um, uh, compiling Sparkle to SQL, to Spark SQL specifically. Now, the way they're doing it, single table, no special format. So it's easy to use, but it's not really optimized. So it's very slow for large graphs like our main graph. The one I have in this demo here is a smaller graph, the mesh and clinical trials one. It's smaller, so it's much more manageable. But even then, it still can take a few minutes to work. Now, there's this, uh, uh, in the future, what we're looking to is to implement this um, uh, paper listed on the screen where the querying is optimized so that you take your graph and you decompose it into multiple tables. And that lets you get the advantage of the, the SQL structure, the relational database structure, um, uh, while having all the great stuff in graph, graphs. Uh, okay, so now I would like to switch over to the demo. So, um, in this demo, uh, we have our mesh and our clinical trials data set all rebuilt. Um, and uh, just to show, so this is what the triples look like. Um, so uh, here we see this is a reference to some entity within mesh, and uh, it was just referring to what its type is. It's a concept, and we see a, a lot of these uh, sort of nodes. And um, uh, I believe in this data set, it's about 23 million, of which about 5 million are, are ones we've extracted from clinical trials. Um, so first we want to pull off the query config. 
Um, uh, so that's defined in our configuration that I mentioned at the beginning. So this is a query we're going to run. So this is a pretty, seems like a pretty complex query, but really what it's trying to do is it's, um, uh, it's going to be pulling out the different uh, groups of brain diseases and the interventions that are used for them. Now, what's great about this is that you could not do this with either data set alone, with either MeSH or, or clinical trials. So um, MeSH has also all information of, well, what's a brain disease of the specific information and then tying it back up to say like, oh, this particular thing is a brain disease. Um, but clinical trials has a relationship to the interventions. So you really need to fuse them in order to get this insight. So um, I will go through sort of like the uh, the details of what the Sparkle is doing, but it's building up this um, uh, connection between the condition and the intervention. Um, so let's go see what, what outputs from that. So here we see the, the condition. Now, this isn't the actual condition mentioned in the clinical trial. This is actually the... Um, uh, uh, this is actually the parent level. So um, we take the condition mentioned in the trial, we map it back up to brain disease, and then we go one step down. So to, we map it to a child of brain disease. So, um, and then we have the different labels. So it looks like uh, there's a child here where they were looking at olive oil, which is interesting. So um, uh, now what we want to do is I want to pull this into Python and I want to take a look at the actual relationship. So I pull into Python, and I'm just going to use Network X to do a little plot. So here we have pulled it into Pandas, uh, build a graph. Let's just go down and look at the graph. So here we have this relationship that we've extracted from our data set. And from here, you can look at this, and you can get some insights that, as I said, wouldn't have been possible if we were just using MASH or just using clinical trials. Uh, uh, Okay, that's it for the demo. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Um, uh, are there any questions? Yeah, and uh, as mentioned in the slides, you know, we there is a website that will have much more information about the library itself and some samples and tutorials. So please check that out as well. And looking forward to your feedback on the library. Thank you. And we'll answer questions now.